Our second speaker today is Julia Roos, who is an associate professor at Indiana University Bloomington. She specializes in 20th century German history with a focus on gender, race, and propaganda. She's the author of several articles, as well as the book Weimar Through the Lens of Gender, Prostitution, Reform, and Women's Emancipation and German Democracy, which was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2010. She's currently at work on a book comparing debates in Germany on biracial children after the two world wars. And um, so I will turn it over to you, Julia. Thank you. between 600 and 800 children of French colonial soldiers and German mothers born during um, the 1920s, during the first Rhineland occupation. The Nazis used the racist epithet Rheinland Bastarde, Rhineland Bastards, for these children. We still know very little about the lives of these children or the surviving members of this generation after 1945. And this really is part of the strong focus in the existing literature on race after Hitler uh, and German racial re-education on the US zone of occupation. For instance, we know a lot about uh, the biracial children of African-American GIs born after World War II. Um, about 25% though of biracial children born after World Second World War were actually French, had French colonial fathers and we know very little about these children. And I see this paper as part of a, a broader um, effort to kind of recenter our uh, um, interest in race after Hitler in Germany uh, away from the US zone of occupation, which is important, but to take also into account de developments within the French zone of occupation, which I think are actually quite important as well for uh, understanding both continuities and realignments in German racial discourse over people of color after the Second World War. While the children of American soldiers um, who are present in 1950s West Germany are a new phenomenon, the children of colonial French soldiers are not because there was a precedent already in the 1920s there had been children of colonial French soldiers in Germany and this is why this uh, generation of the 1920s actually provides us with an important link for comparing the Weimar Republic, the Nazi regime, and the Federal Republic in terms of racial discourse. Today I want to um, focus on one example that I think shows that looking, paying more attention to what's going on in the French zone of occupation is quite fruitful for understanding race after 45 in Germany. Um, and that is trials, attempts to, to prosecute doctors who had participated in these forced sterilizations of the biracial Rhenish children. A couple of things I think that we can pull out of such an analysis. Um, one, we can see that racist stereotypes of the Rheinland Bastarde had significant longevity after the war. I also think these trials shed light on another facet of race after 45. Um, when we talk about the erasure of race that, that Emily is, is going to talk about, how does eugenics fi fit into that? Because eugenics is widely accepted still long after the end of the Second World War. And the trials of the doctors, uh, one of which I will talk, talk about, actually show that eugenics could be a way of hiding continuities in anti-black racism and that it is uh, at the same time a kind of racism directed as, at you know people within one's own ethnic or, or racial group considered inferior. So how does this fit into race after the Second World War? By looking at the uh, last but not least the doctor's trials um, we can see that victims actually play an important role in the quest for denazification and justice after the Second World War and I believe that these trials in the French zone may also shed some fresh light on the very negative assessment of French denazification that still prevails in the literature. There may be here um, an instance of a hitherto unacknowledged, albeit limited, um, achievement within certain limitations of French denazification. 
I want to focus on the case of one doctor whom I call Dr. Maya, that's not his real name, but it's extremely <laughs> hard uh, to, to get at these uh, archival sources and uh, historians have to sign lots of paperwork uh, in German archives that they're going to anonymize all the names and it's not quite clear to me in this case why I have to do this, but I will do it uh, to comply and so um, because these doctors are long dead and uh, um, in any event. So Dr. Maya, in, in uh, July of 1948, the French military government informed uh, German authorities, the French military government in Rhineland Palatinate, um, that they had evidence implicating Dr. <coughs> Dr. Ludwig Meyer, the former deputy director of the state health office in the city of Worms, of being implicated, of having potentially participated in the 1937 forced sterilizations of at least three descendants of colonial French soldiers. And French authorities then um, uh, order the state prosecutor in Mainz to investigate Meyer and his former um, superior, Dr. Müller, for a crime against humanity as defined by Allied Control Council Law Number 10. Maya also stood accused of having denounced one of the female victims to the secret police, the Gestapo, for uh, hostility towards the state. Um, now, two factors that potentially worked in Maya, to Maya's advantage were A, these criminal investigations into his activities took place at a time when denazification throughout the western zones had lost much of its rigor already. And two, um, the Allies after World War II considered the Nazi era law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased progeny, uh, an anti-sterilization law that's passed in July of 1933. They don't consider this a, an unambiguously Nazi law, uh, partly because Western, there are a number of Western democracies at the time that have similar laws providing for eugenic sterilizations. So as long as the law also included very limited provisions for a legal appeal against um, a medical dis against the dis uh, sterilization decision. So in many cases, the Allies thought that was enough proof that patients' rights had been protected under this law, which meant that doctors very rarely got actually indicted and victims very rarely got compensated. Now, in the case of the biracial children, what this case was a bit different because there had been no process before a health court. There had really not been any possibility of legal appeal. And these kids were very clearly targeted uh, for racial reasons. Uh, anthropological racism was very obvious here. Now, um, obviously eugenics is, is, is always uh, uh, deeply racial and racialized, but the Allies subscribed to the fiction that there could be a scientific eugenics and on, and on the other hand, a racial political Nazi eugenics. And this 1933 law was not per se considered a racial political Nazi eugenics law. And so Dr. Meyer's really defense rested on the need to show that he had perhaps participated in, in naming individuals for uh, sterilization, uh, but he had not participated in any racial political sterilizations. The local denazification committee in the city of Worms had actually obtained a list of five individuals who had been sterilized because they were descendants of French colonial soldiers. One of them had died very shortly after the end of the war. He had been imprisoned first in Dachau and then in Buchenwald, but four of the five were still alive. And for Meyer's trial in particular, um, the testimonies, the witness testimonies of two mothers and one female victim uh, were, were important. Um, I, the victim, I call her Lise Lotte Stein, and her mother, she was born out of wedlock, so her mother's last name is different. Her mother is Eva Förster. These were the two key people who had the most damning uh, uh, evidence against Maya. Um, the mother, Eva, testified that uh, Maya had played a crucial role in the racial persecution of her daughter and in the sterilization. She claimed she had been summoned to the health office in 35 and 36 repeatedly. She had been harangued by Maya personally for having 
uh, uh, for her a taste for uh, a racial others, that she had a, ch had a child with a, a man who was racially alien, and to make matters worse, a man who uh, wore the an, um, uniform <coughs> of, a, of an enemy nation. The father of her daughter had been a Vietnamese uh, French soldier who had been briefly stationed in Worms during um, the mid-1920s. The daughter was nine years at the time of her sterilization. She says, I really cannot remember that much. I do believe my mother's uh, recollections are correct. The daughter, Lisa Lotte, did remember another encounter with this health official in 1944 when she had been arrested and when he examines her uh, and her ment for her mental capacities. And um, during this exam, um, she believed uh, Maya had uh, tried to uh, um, find out her political viewpoints. She said, one of the questions he asked me is, do you often listen to the radio to inform yourself? Um, do you think, uh, how do you think the war is going to end? She had told Maya at the time, I don't really care how the war ends because I will not be having a stake in the future since I cannot have any children anyway. Um, he, she said in this conversation he accused her of hostility towards the state. She was then arrested by the uh, police and um, uh, one of the uh, duty officers in the prison she claimed had told her that she had been arrested because she had been denounced for hostility towards the state and listening to foreign radio, which could, could uh, uh, mean a capital uh, a punishment. She was convinced Maya was the one who had denounced her since she said, I never talked to anyone about the radio or, or my political views. The third statement against Maya was by another mother who <coughs> corroborated that um, Maya had played a central role in the sterilizations also of her nine-year-old son and that the whole way this was done was very secretive, that the parents had not been informed beforehand what kind of tr surgery the children would undergo. They had been separated from their children and refuse, uh, had been refused to see their children. So very much corroborated this was a coercive, secretive measure which even by the very poor standards of the 1933 sterilization law, the, the health officials had not followed the law. Okay. Um, the women's testimony was dangerous to Maya, um, and this at a point where Maya had hoped his troubles were over, because he had first in 1946 been by uh, the, the Central Purification Committee in Neustadt, had classified him in group two in the second highest category of culpability as someone who had benefited and actively supported the Nazi regime. He had lost his job at the health office um, and then uh, in summer of 1947 had appealed against this ruling and then after another year the um, denazification court had basically endorsed his account that he had not been a ma Nazi ideologue, that he had tried to help Jewish uh, uh, colleagues, that he really was a physician dedicated to helping the poor and that he had been deluded enough uh, to, to believe this is what the Nazi regime was about. He also claimed the more he realized that the Nazi regime was starting to attack the Protestant church, the more he had identified with the confessing church and gone into a kind of inner as well as open opposition against the regime. So it looked like um, uh, in the, in, um, in June of 1948 that he had been exonerated. At this point, French authorities intervene because the, the um, revised sentence was not based on a study of the women's testimonies. And French authorities had gotten hold of these ten testimonies. Uh, one Monsieur Laurent, who was the delegate of the French military government for the Circle of Worms, had obtained these statements by Lise Lotte and Eva and the third mother and forwarded them to um, Dr. Schaffer, director of public health of the French military government of Rhineland-Palatinate in Koblenz, just one week after Maya had been reclassified into Group 4, fellow traveler, 
which had removed uh, any uh, obstacles for him to practice medicine and be employed in the civil service, and which had also drastically reduced the fine he had to pay. So now the French authorities were making matters complicated again for Maya. Uh, and um, Dr. Schaefer actually had heard about Maya because he had been involved in another case where a man who, to my best knowledge, wasn't biracial, had accused Maya of of illegally st having him sterilized. And Dr. Schaefer says this, this is a dubious character, a, sh uh, a shift, you know, this is a very questionable physician. And this new evidence suggests that Maya has been deeply involved uh, in performing one or more sterilizations for purely racial reasons. So that then would have qualified for Allied Control Council law number 10. Um, in July, Governor Claude Etier de Bois-Lambert, Delegué General of the French Military Government of Rhineland-Palatinate, instructs German authorities to investigate uh, against Maya, and also um, at the same time, uh, the denazification court is supposed to revisit the denazification and, and uh, consider the new evidence, the testimony of the three women. This is a little confusing. Denazification courts could not hand down criminal sentences. Um, that had to be done by the state prosecutor. So we have two, se two parallel but entangled and intertwined legal uh, processes here. Um, Alice, do I have five more minutes? Okay, okay, good. Then I want to highlight a few aspects of Maya's legal defense. Um, it is very striking that uh, in his legal defense, things that become apparent is his sense of status, uh, being a civil servant, being a, an educated, up middle class civil servant, and his sense of moral respectability and, and, and upstanding Christian uh, Protestant uh, respectability uh, help him evade questions, uncomfortable questions, about his own implication in violent Nazi racial policies. In fact, during the criminal investigation by the state prosecutor, evidence does surface that Maya knew about the racially motivated sterilization campaign against the Rhenish children well before that campaign had been completed, and also that he drew the attention of the authorities to at least one biracial child, th knowing that, that there might be repercussions, that at the very least that child would lose um, important social benefits or welfare benefits um, it, it wouldn't be getting as a biracial child. The state prosecutor ultimately decided not to pursue potentially more incriminating evidence against Maya. Um, Maya was very angry, accused the French authorities of listening to criminal elements and basically degenerates uh, who um, were trying to uh, destroy him as a, as a <coughs> upstanding and dutiful uh, civil servant who had, nothing, had done nothing wrong. Uh, he doesn't openly talk about them in terms of, uh, you know, notions of blackness or as people of color. Um, uh, rather, he talks about them in terms of criminality, but there is a sense that this criminality, there is, there is something uh, biological uh, uh, determined, or we would say genetically determined about it. Um, and um, he defends himself. He has never had anything, he never had anything to do with the sterilizations. He didn't know about any aspect of the sterilizations beforehand. And um, he was the victim of a uh, denunciation campaign. And um, now if we look at a, uh, how Maya talked about Lisa Lotte in the files from the 1940s. It's very clear that he had, a, you know, perceived her as a racial other, and that for him, her criminality, her working class background, her poverty, and her racial otherness were all as related aspects. Um, uh, he examined her when she is arrested in 1944. She's arrested because she's told two German soldiers that she's pregnant with their child. <coughs> Of course, at that point, she has been sterilized, and she's accused of 
um, trying to get money from the so soldiers under false pretenses. Maya examines her, um, for, uh, on um, her mental state, and then I just want to um, quote from some aspects of his report. His 1944 report that emphasizes her working class background, her criminality, she has a previous conviction for theft, and then he spends a lot of time on what he perceives as her um, racial otherness, her, her Asian uh, characteristics. Um, this report from October 1944 mentions um, that she has, shows, quote, clear signs of uh, Mongol influences. Maya concluded that Lisa Lotte did not suffer from any intellectual deficiency that would have impaired her sense of the wrongfulness of her actions. And now I quote, her case is merely an example of an inferiority of character, um, which is explained by the fact of the ambiguity of her descent. She is the typical bastard uh, who stands moodily, unausgeglichen, between the races. So there's no evidence in this report that he denounced her to the Gestapo, but there is plenty of evidence that he shared the belief widespread among racial hygienists uh, that um, so-called mixed-race individuals were dangerous to society, were inferior, even if they were above average intelligence, intellig uh, of above average intelligence, um, uh, were kind of dangerous elements. Very briefly, what are some of the larger points we can pull out of this? Neither Maya nor his superior are ultimately convicted. Both of them are fully reinstated and exonerated. And by the early 1950s, actually work in the same uh, state health office in a major industrial city in Rhineland Palatinate, again, side by side. The authorities never find the surgeon who act did the actual uh, surgery on these children. So in some ways, this is, this is a case that would confirm our sense denazification utterly failed here. And um, I do want to highlight a few partial successes. One, these doctors did lose their jobs, in, in Maya's case, you know, for several years. So at least there was some discomfort ca caused here. The victims seem to have been energized by the opportunity to name their tormentors, and this motivated them to claim rights. So Lisa Lotte and the, the son of the other woman, Otto, both of them file for reparations. Lisa Lotte actually gets publicly funded refertilization treatment. I don't know whether she was successful. The success rate of those is very low. Otto never got any reparations. I've looked at the two other trials and seen something similar, that this was kind of a moment galvanizing uh, among the victims' efforts to claim reparations. So there is an energizing impulse that comes out of this. Um, and we do see in this case the French authorities are persistent. They are trying. They're trying e to put together a second uh, uh, trial against these doctors, and ultimately that doesn't, doesn't uh, work out. Um, I also think if we, uh, for our discussion about race after the Second World War, um, what we can see here is the outcome of Maya's trial points to the resilience of nationalist and racialist uh, resentment against the French occupiers and their biracial German descendants from the Weimar Republic to, to the very, very early Federal de Republic. And this can serve as an important caveat not to exaggerate the extent to which um, it, not to exaggerate the extent of post-1945 realignment in German racial discourse over people of color. Heide Fehrenbach has argued that the encounter with Jim Crow in the U.S. Army taught Germans, quote, the post-war lesson that democratic forms and values were consistent with, with racialist, even racist ideology and social organization, end of quote. Now, racial discrimination against individuals vilified as Rheinland Bastarde reached back into the liberal parliamentary Weimar Republic. Germans thus already know well before the arrival knew well before the arrival of American troops in 1945 that certain forms of anti-black racism, at least, were compatible with flawed democracy. Okay, thank you.